Time now for sports on 104.7 The Cave. Here's Ned Reynolds. Mike, the intern, Ned Reynolds, in the studio. It's Monday. The Chiefs are in Arizona, or as you like to call it, the Valley of the Sun. <laughs> exactly. Either way, uh, they're going to be practicing down in Arizona this week before the NFL championship game on Sunday against the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, some guys, it looks like, are going to be back to play. Of course, uh, McColl is definitely not going to make that, which is unfortunate. But uh, we saw some receivers step up in the AFC Championship game. What about some of these other guys that have been on the fence? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that about Hardman because, no, he is, it says, doubtful. No, he's more than doubtful. He, he won't play. It's risking too much of a permanent injury to that pelvis. So, no, they, they won't put him in that. First of all, they'll probably have a workout today, but then tomorrow they, tomorrow they really get a workout because it's the media day. Have you ever seen media day at the Super Bowl? Uh, it's a circus. It, yeah, it, it's a circus for a week, basically. Oh, it's it's going to be a circus for a week. Ridiculous. Well, the Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles will both practice off in private, and the media really isn't allowed in there except maybe for the first five minutes, and that's it. Willie Gay is most likely in. He will play. Juju Smith-Schuster, Legarius Sneed, Kadarius Tony. These these individuals are all iffy right now. Schuster has that kind of troublesome knee injury that he's had, and it's nothing new. He's had this injury for quite a while. And how quickly it comes around, and of course it's going to be slower the more times you injure that knee. Uh, we'll, we'll see. That'll be probably a late-week decision. Lajarius Sneed, I have a feeling, is going to play. He went through some stretching. This is concussion protocol for Sneed, but I think he's probably going to be allowed in there. And Kadarius Tony, there's no no answer for him at all. <laughs> he has an ankle and a hamstring. He's prone to these injuries. Had him with the Giants. He had him now. He, he was out for four weeks when the Chiefs got him. So I think that's probably a little bit on the iffy side, but... Uh, While we had talked all season long about the Chiefs being injury-free, now they do have some. However, the Chiefs do have plenty of weapons, and they have Patrick Mahomes, who appears to be well on his way to full recovery. So, indeed, I think the Chiefs are probably in pretty good shape. Let's give it up to one of the greatest training staffs in all of pro football to keep these guys as healthy as as they have been during the regular season and hopefully getting them back for the Super Bowl on Sunday. So I know you were the bell of the ball this weekend and pretty much everywhere in town. If it was sports-related, Ned was there at least for five minutes. How'd the uh, weekend of events go for you? The bell of the ball. I have you no, are the bell of the ball. I have no bells, and I uh, better not get into the other <laughs> <laughs> We did. We had the uh, Hall of Fame event yesterday out at the fairgrounds. Very nice. Uh, a little on the long side, but it was very nice. I'll tell you who was there that kind of surprised me a little bit. Roy Williams, the longtime coach at Kansas and North Carolina. He's now retired. He came up here to see one of his great All-Americas, Tyler Hansbro, from a Poplar Bluff, inducted into the Hall of Fame. That was very nice. For some very good, excellent uh, exceptions, acceptances, I should say, of the of the Hall of Fame induction. It was a very nice event. On Saturday night, we had the Bears fundraiser. The It's called First Pitch, and we had it over at the Bill Road Training Center at Hammonds Field. That was also a very big deal and very well attended. Jake Berger, who is... And he's going to try to be he's penciled in right now as a third baseman for the Chicago White Sox, one of the Bears' great players. He was the guest of honor, but you also had the 2003 World Series team, and you had last year's NCAA tournament team getting their rings. It was very nice. Daryl Smith had his boxing event that went on. I was there for a prelim on Friday night with former world heavy, uh, well, light heavyweight and heavyweight champion Michael Spinks. He was there. Former heavyweight champion, too, in Merciless Ray Mercer. He was there. It was it was a good time. Very good time. And a big fundraiser for Daryl Smith or Smitty's Boxing Gym over on Cine. So a good time was had by all. And it definitely looked like it was a good time in California over the weekend for the uh, Bush Clash at the Coliseum. What a cool race. This man. is the second time they've held this. It's, it's a NASCAR exhibition, but it's also the opening to the NASCAR season. The real opening comes in two weeks with the Daytona 500. But for this, they, <laughs> they being NASCAR, have put out a quarter-mile track around the Coliseum. They did it last year, drew a crowd of about 65,000, and it was pretty good racing. Last night's event was really not very good racing, in all honesty. They had 25 yellow flags. Now, keep in mind, it's a quarter its a quarter of a mile. There's a lot of bumping and pushing, and it's a narrow track, And but it, it's, it's unique. The winner, 
The winner was Martin Truex Jr. driving the Bass Pro Shops car, his first win in over a year. And this was very satisfying to him in a couple of respects. He got the win, number one, but number two, he's contemplating retirement. And to have a victory after a year and a half of no wins at all, very big deal for him. So I didn't see the attendance. Uh, it looked to be a pretty good crowd at the oh, yeah. Coliseum. Oh, this, yeah. is, this is the Coliseum, folks, which is in uh, one of the inner regions of Los Angeles. And like everything, it's, 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 you know, it's was built back in 1920, so <laughs> it is not something that's new. But the track is, and they put that track around their quarter-mile track, and it's it's very interesting to see them race in short track situations like that. Do you think that had something to do with the uh, the yellow flags yesterday, the short well, track? Well, it, it depends on the driver's philosophy, because last year they didn't have anywhere near that many. It yeah. was pretty smooth riding. But this year, just a matter of circumstance, one of the factors they, they happened to mention was the fact that it was 93 in Los Angeles yesterday, yeah. but the temperature in an hour dropped 25 degrees, Whoa. and the track got a little slippery, so yeah. that may have had something That probably to do with did it. have something to do with it. So, yesterday, tough day for the Bears, wasn't it? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to see the game because we were over at the Hall of Fame, but I did follow it. You can follow these things on your cell phone and things like that. And this was not a vintage performance by Missouri State. They go to Southern Illinois at Carbondale, and the Salukis outscored the Bears by 16 points in the second half, and Southern Illinois wins 73-53. I think the most disturbing thing that I was able to determine from what I can see on that is the Bears committed 16 turnovers. That's very, very un un bears like unbear like <laughs> and when you when you take a look at that you look at the other stat which is how many points did the other team score on those turnovers how about 26 26 points for southern illinois of their 73 on the scoreboard caused by turnovers bears don't have one of their key players in there donovan clay the senior he's been ill and apparently still is he didn't play yesterday but the Bears being outscored like that in the second half after being in the contest in the first half, down by four at halftime. Just couldn't get things going, didn't shoot the ball particularly well. Again, had a tough day from the foul line, 8 of 16. Hey, guys, they know fully well. They've got to get things together because right now they're falling into the nether regions of the play-in coming up or the playoffs coming up in the conference tournament. The way it works this year with the teams they have in there, Mike, is that the first four teams in the standings, first four, have a bye going into the Friday quarterfinals. All the other teams have to play on Thursday, which means Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, if you stay alive in the thing. That's going to be tough. When the only basketball played this weekend, we had two of arguably the best teams in women's college basketball face off with each other. And uh, before we talk about that, though, got to give it up to Indiana. In Purdue. <laughs> Holy Knocking. crap. Well, you you have to be over in the Hoosier State to understand the rivalry between Indiana yeah, and but Purdue. Man, Purdue what is a game. in West Lafayette, Indiana. And when they get together, throw the records out. Oh, man. What a game. Anyway, so yeah, uh, two of women's best in college basketball played yesterday. Who got the dub? Well, first of all, Mike's making reference to Purdue. Number one in America won't be number one no this week. No more. Not this week. Indiana beat them. And that, oh, you have to know the Hoosiers love that. Oh, man. <laughs> I, as soon as that game was over, you could tell it. That whole stadium, that whole court turned red. It was pretty cool to watch. The game yesterday in Hartford, Connecticut, matched up last year's national championship finalists, South Carolina and Connecticut. Connecticut, of course, under Gino Oriema, seems to be there all the time. This year, they have injury problems. They're not the Connecticut team of the past, but, Mike, they are still pretty doggone good, let me tell you. Played South Carolina yesterday. South Carolina defending national champs were going for their 29th consecutive victory, and they got it. Coming from behind to get the win. Lady Gamecocks got an 81-77 to win uh, by, obviously, for the six-point margin here. But the fact of the matter remains that Connecticut had the lead. And Connecticut led them by, oh, 12 to 14 points at one time in the first half and could not sustain it. Perfectly understandable. South Carolina under Dawn Staley is a great basketball team. Connecticut is probably, in all fairness, not in that category this year. They will be again. Count on it. But this year they are not. And South Carolina wins its 29th straight game, 81-77 over Connecticut <clears throat> in what was really, in all essence, a headline basketball matchup. It could be 
as the tournament goes on, and when we started in March, it could be they play again somewhere along the line. Wouldn't that be something, but definitely uh, wouldn't be outside the realm of possibility. Last but not least, I know that you were way too busy to be taking a nap watching golf, like uh, my dad, for example, this weekend, but who got the win at Pebble Beach? The only ones who got the win were the amateurs. Now, this is the Pebble Beach, the AT&T Pebble Beach National Pro-Am Tournament. So you have amateur teams teamed up with pros, and then the amateur teams get completely together. Uh, so you only had the amateurs win because the pros play with suspended because of high winds out in the Monterey Peninsula. And get this. The pro team that won was the amateur team of Ben Silverman, and I must admit I don't know who he was, but I do know his partner, Aaron Rodgers. How about this? Aaron Rodgers, and what was he plagued by? The reporters, hey, are you are you going to San Francisco, which is out there, of course, in mid-California? And his answer was, no. Period exclamation point. <laughs> but pretty good golfer, and he and his he and his partner win the amateur division. The pros will complete their round today, and we'll just have to wait and see what, what happens. Well, looks like you might be getting a nap this afternoon, my guy. Maybe. Maybe right. so. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Let me know what happens. If you don't, Ned, I'll see you tomorrow.